Our next speaker is William O'Brien um, from the U University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, Urbana Champaign, uh, quantitative ultrasound imaging of cells, tissues, and tumors. Well, I'm waiting for this to come up. 100 years ago, just a little over 100 years ago, to put things in perspective, DeForest just had invented the vacuum tube. So we've actually come quite a ways. And 50 years ago, uh, Bill Fry was using the technique called uh, retrograde atrophy to using ultrasound to map out the brain circuits. So for those of you who have interest, and I know a number of you do, about brain circuitry, you might want to Google Bill Fry, William, William J. Fry, and look at his techniques and what he did with ultrasound back then to uh, develop a map of a small portion of a cat brain. Oh. Nobody's taking a, making a record of this meeting, so I think I will. <laughs> Smile. Smile on this side. <laughs> I'll sell it to you. Let's see, I need a... All right, change of pace with uh, ultrasound. Um, I'm, I'm not doing any simulations. I'm not doing anything very fast. Uh, what else am I not doing? Well, I'm, I'm going to be showing you what I think we'll be doing, we'll be extracting from ultrasound information, I guess, the next generation. That was the, uh, that was the assignment. And so what I want to do uh, today is to talk about a, a model-based concept of uh, what we're doing and then talk about showing you with different types of tumors. These, uh, these uh, government-looking symbols are 4T1 and MAT are uh, malignant tumors, and then CHO and 3T3 are benign tumors. Well, neither of those are tumors, they're just cells. They don't grow. Uh, uh, CHO is the Chinese hamster ovary cells, and 3T3 is a fibroblast cell. MAT and 4T1 uh, are mammary tumors. And that's what we'll be using to show a few things about how we're going to extract some information. The, the concept that, that we use is we want to work in the sweet spot of the backscattered signal. Um, when, we, when we go through physics, when we learn physics and engineering and that, we always work in, with asymptotic approximations in order to make life a lot easier for us mathematically. We'll either say the wavelength is very small relative to the objects of interest. So there we use uh, Snell's law. Um, or we'll say that the wavelength is quite large relative to what we're scattering, and then we're talking about really scattering principles. We're going to work in the range where the wavelength, we work, this technique works best when the wavelength is about the same size as the object or objects of interest. And that's what we'll be doing. So the approach is a model-based approach. <clears throat> if you go to the bottom of that slide where it says the backscatter coefficient, that's our basic building block. Okay? And from that basic building block, um, which is really the backscattered signal, that has been uh, normalized against a known reference, we can do a lot of things. We can do a lot of model-based um, imaging. So we're going to use a priori information. In other words, we develop a model, and then we're going to be looking at how well that model works relative to um, the uh, task at hand. We're going to be doing some work both at the cellular and tissue level. Our interest is in uh, mammary tumors, but we also work in some other areas here. So, but uh, the, the tumors that we'll work with are mammary tumors. 
So the first thing I want to convince you is with one, one slide that this uh, cross-platform compatibility works. This is the backscatter coefficient as a function of frequency using four separate imaging systems imaging exactly the same tumor. The, the, the image on the right, it represents uh, you know, realization of five realizations for each of the transducers of those imaging systems. So they all are, are uh, grouped on top of one another. The left is the average of each of them. So there's got, we've got four systems, and of the four systems, there are two, four, six, seven uh, transducers. We have a Siemens 2000, Visual Sonics 2100, uh, Ultrasonics, and then uh, Zanari system. And this is with a tumor. This is with a mat tumor, but we've, we get even better re results when we do physical phantoms. So we've got pretty much all of the math figured out and how to do it right. It's just a matter of now utilizing this information. Um, let's talk about first single cell properties. Um, we want to work with, we, want to, we need information about the single cell. And we, so we developed a scattering model for a cell in the form of a concentric uh, sphere, as shown there. On the left, you see some H and E stained images of, uh, of a, a CHO cells. And on the right, you just sort of see a depiction of what we use to develop the mathematics of the scattering models. So we'll have a scattering model of this um, cell um, built in, and we'll have the power spectrum of the concentric sphere and compare it to the power spectrum of what we measure from the materials. Um, we do want to make some measurements. We want to know sizes. So uh, we, we culture these cells, and so we wind up, you get a sense of what the size are, is of uh, CHO cells, the, the black bars are the nucleus, the pinkish ones are the diameters of the cell. And the range goes somewhere from about, uh, this is about, about 5 microns, 10 microns, about 16 microns uh, for the CHO. And you can see the mean uh, diameters for the nucleus of the cell. Over here, the, the, the 3T3 cells, in typical cells in culture, if you culture them a couple times, they get smaller. It's sort of a natural process, so we check that out. And indeed, you can see that the old and the, the, the old and the new, the new are larger than the old. So our ability to make these measurements uh, of sizes, you know, were pretty good. And then we also did it for the MAT and the 4T1. And I'll, I'll show this one again to you in a, uh, when we get a little work further into the talk. The thing to note for the, the, the mat in the tumor, again, this is about 6, 10, 13, 17 microns. We're at about 7. This is about 14. This is about 21 microns. Give you a sense of the sizes we're talking about. These are diameters. And the, and the thing to watch here is that for the mat tumor, they're, they're clumped in size. The distribution of their sizes is not very great compared to the 4T1. The 4T1 is, has a much wider uh, standard deviation, larger standard deviation. I'll come back to that in a moment. This is just an example of one mat cell where we have a, we have a project where we're making acoustic measurements of the acoustic properties of the cytoplasm and the nucleus speed and attenuation so that we can, when you see later on, how we're going to be trying to pull out numbers like the speed and attenuation of cells, you know, <clears throat> we want to have something to go back to and what we measured because later on it'll be, we'll be pulling those numbers out from a statistical basis. Um, so we have this process going on. This is a field here. This is about uh, 30 microns by 30 microns field of view. The right-hand figure up there has been Photoshop enhanced just to be able to show the contrast where the nucleus is relative to the cell. Um, and you can get a sense in this one example, for example, the uh, cytoplasm and the nucleus speeds were about the same, and, but there was a 
we're seeing a fairly consistent difference in the attenuation coefficient of the nucleus um, relative uh, to the cytoplasm. And these measurements, by the way, were made at 200 megahertz. Um, okay, biological fandoms. Um, we, we, <clears throat> we, we make biological phantoms by taking a group of cells in plasma and adding thrombin, and within a matter of a second or two, the thrombin clots the plasma. So then the cells wind up being fixed in space, and then we scan them ultrasonically. Now the sweet spot, again, for where we want to be is around a Ka of 1, or lambda and D being somewhat close to one another. And for these cells, <coughs> Ka of 1 is sort of in the range of 40, 50, 60 microns, depending on whether we're talking about Ka of the nucleus or the cell. Now this is an example of the colored lines represent acquired data. There's two realizations. This was done with a 40 megahertz and this was done with an 80 megahertz transducer. But the results I'm going to show you are with three separate cell pellets. This is a scan the cell pellet with a 40 megahertz and an 80 megahertz, but we did two others. Just for cleanness of the figure, I'm just showing you one cell pellet at each of the concentrations. These are the concentrations, the number density of the cells. So if you could read it over to the right, the number density at the lowest one is about 1.25 million cells per ml. And then the number density increases as consistent within the backscatter coefficient increasing. And this is as a function of frequency going from about 10 up to a little over 100 megahertz. The, the black line there is a, is a least squares fit in a MATLAB routine uh, to fit the, fit the data. <clears throat> and it's the black line that we fit then to the, uh, to the form factor, which is the concentric sphere. From that, what we obtain from the individual cells, this is now statistically speaking because this represents a large number of cells, going from left to right, from blue to orange, blue is, um, uh, I'll talk in terms of volume density so you get a sense of how packed these are. This is a volume density of about 0.2% going up to orange, which is a volume density of about 63%. This is the radius of the nucleus that comes from the analysis from the acoustically acquired data through the backscatter coefficient to the model of the concentric sphere. This is the radius of the, of the, the cell itself. And so in the, the dark yellow lines are the mean values from the independent measures of the size. And so, so you, can, you can get a sense that when the number density is low, the volume density may be up to about purple, up to about purple here. Purple is at about 10% volume density. You get a sense that you get a reasonable result of the size relative to, say, the mean value of the independent measures. Over here on the right, then, is where we pull out the speed and density of, this is the density of the cytoplasm, and this is the density of the nucleus. This is 1, and then grams per ml, et cetera. This is speed of the cytoplasm, speed of the nucleus. And these numbers come in reasonable with what we would expect relative to what we're seeing as we make independent measures of them. And then there's a group in Toronto also that's been making some of these measurements of individual cells, or groups of cells pulling out nuclei by, by themselves. Again, you can, you can get a sense that once you get above about the purple, which is about 10%, the model and what we do starts to break apart, starts to fall apart. The last two groupings here, by the way, are just simply the product of the density and the speed, or in other words, the impedance. It's just the product of the density and the speed. So 
um, for now with this particular model, uh, the, concentric, the concentric sphere model shows good quantitative agreement with the backscatter coefficient estimates for, actually we showed you one, the CHO, but we did this for the other three cells also, and we get consistent results up to a volume density of about 10%. Once you get above about 10%, then the, the model itself starts to, to break apart. So it shows that when you meet all the criteria uh, of the model, things, are, things tend to work pretty well. Um, but we're interested not only in pulling data from cells, but we're interested in pulling data from tissues and tumors. So. Let me remind you again, here's that, uh, that, uh, the mat and the 4T1. These are the only two cells that we could actually get to grow that we work with in, uh, in, in animals. Obviously, CHO and 3T3 are not malignant. They don't grow. So these are the two. But I wanted to again remind you <clears throat> for a moment that, again, you've got a wider distribution here in sizes you know, for the 4T1. Now we want to compare, the reason we want to do work with the malignant cells here is because we want to compare the results from the cell pellet results. In this case now the cell pellets are at a volume density of 100 okay. percent. So we, we're trying to model the tumor, but we model the tumor by way of the uh, cells just by trying to cram all the cells into the volume and scanning them. And those represent the gray lines both figures. Those are the uh, results from the cell pellet. The blue lines are actually from tumors. We grew up the tumors in rats and mice respectively, removed them because we're, we're really scanning a very small portion and under a special condition. And the scanning of the tumors were done within 30 minutes of the time of excision. And likewise, the scanning of the cell pellets, I didn't measure mentioned we're done within 30 minutes of the time of the clotting process. So we're, we're pretty close to at least architecturally the cells and the tumors being close to being in vivo conditions. Okay. Now, now the thing to note here for the, the mat is, is that the mat tumor, the mat cells are the ones that had a relatively narrow distribution. So what we see with the cell pellets is much more of a peaking there. In other words, the kind of behavior you would expect if, if, if everything were exactly the same size, you'd start to get look, look, looking like somewhat resonant type structures. Uh, the blue is that of the, the, the tumor itself. Now, a mat tumor is an extremely aggressive tumor. It grows so fast in the animal that angiogenesis doesn't keep up with it completely and it, it starts developing pockets, there's patches everywhere you can look at under H&E of, of necrosis. Okay, so you get these little pockets or patches of necrosis. So not only do you have the cell scattering, but you have these little pockets of necrosis scattering also. Okay. For the, for the, 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 three, the, the 4T1, they do look somewhat similar. The thing about the cell pellet not taking on the same nature here as the peaking here is that the cell pellets here have a much, on size, the cells are much widely, much more widely distributed. And that wide distribution will tend to dampen the effect of any kind of peaking. And then you have the blue lines, which actually are different, statistically different, even if you start staring at them pretty closely, you can actually start convincing yourself of that uh, between the MAT and the, the 4T1. But what we're particularly interested in is utilizing this model, these data to fit a to fit to model, to fit to a model. Um, here we have fit, fitted, the, the left again is MAT and the right is, again, the 4T1. Now I'm only showing the gray, which are the cell pellets. It's the ones that we have a little more control over. Um, what we have here in terms of, we have two models. We have an Anderson model that we're fitting to 
and the concentric sphere model. You've seen that he used the concentric sphere model already. The Anderson model, we, we posed it under two different conditions. One is that the size of the cell, and this now is the outside diameter, the diameter of the cell per se. Anderson is a fluid-filled sphere. And if we, if we fit it, do a best fit on the mat cell, the red line is for single size, and it best fits at around a little under 10 microns. For the 4T1, Anderson starts to show a pretty strong resin structure there. And it, it basically just doesn't fit. And it doesn't really fit here either. If we, if we take a size distribution for the Anderson model, now that we say, we say that the cells are, have a distribution, okay, and the distributions turned out to be for best fit in the range of 10 to 15 percent that of the uh, standard deviation tended to be about 10 or 15 percent that of the mean value. That's the green. Don't do much better. Likewise here, you get rid of the that because now you have a distribution. In other words, the Anderson model, which a lot of people use, um, doesn't work very well. Put it up there just to show that. Fitting these um, cell pellets to the concentric sphere model, uh, even though we showed with the cell pellets, we, it starts to fall apart a bit. At 100%, we don't do, we're not too bad off. That's the dark blue line here. In here, and these are for sizes that are either 9.4 and 17.3. These are the diameters of the cell and the nucleus. And over there, the 17 and about 10 microns. Um, I just finished doing the distribution, making making the concentric sphere and using distributions. And again, as you looked at those, uh, those graphs of the measured sizes of the cells, both the nuclei and the cell itself themselves had a distribution. Tends to smooth this out consistent, very considerably, and can fit much, much better to the, the actual measurements. So we're not, we're not quite there yet, um, but, the, but the concept is that we're getting close to being able to from a tumor, at least from the, the, the cell pellets, 100% uh, volume density cell pellets, to be able to obtain a reasonable backscatter coefficient and fit it to a model. And in the case of the concentric sphere model, we, we, we seem to be able to fit it to pretty well. So a final thought. Um, I have one more thing just because of what's been talked about this week. Uh, I would like to bounce off you, but, but for the, what I'm presenting, the final thought is that the cell and tissue-based studies allow the development of techniques for constructing better models. So we're moving to the direction of models that will extract from the ultrasound signal itself quantitative parameters of the cell, size, and, its, and their makeup. Uh, challenges, of course, always remain, as we've heard at, for every talk we've heard today and yesterday, um, <clears throat> but we're, we're having a bit of success. Um, not that one. That was supposed to be on my last slide, but I just wanted to um, pop one more thing into you. One, one, these are just two slides here, but I, I want to, and this one's important because I need to give you an equation. This is a, this is a form factor, a theoretical form factor, assuming that the structure is Gaussian. Okay. In other words, the impedance, the impedance distribution of a sphere changes as you move from the center out as a Gaussian, Gaussian shape. And it's a nice one. It fits it. it can, you can solve it real quickly. It doesn't really match a lot of things, but I do want to point out one thing. One of the things you come up with in this is a straight line from the measurement where you have the, you have the intercept and the slope, and, and, the, and n sub z is a quantity in here. Where did it go? Somewhere in here, n sub z, right there. n sub z is what we call an acoustic concentration. It's basically a number 
that is the number density times the square of the relative impedance difference between the scatterer and the background material. So <clears throat> what this model does is it pulls out an effective acoustic concentration. That, so that equation is important. Like a lot of people, we're making three-dimensional volumes of, of tissue. Our three-dimensional volumes, here's an example of what we did. We basically take three micron sections, 200 um, adjacent three micron sections, and stack them together. Put them in the computer and, and do the magic. We've heard all the magic in the last two days. Um, this particular study was done with liver. A little further away from the brain, but uh, that's, we, we had a, a separate study going on with liver. Normal liver and fatty liver. For normal and fatty liver, the effective scatter diameter based on the Gaussian model form factor comes in at about 7 microns in both cases. And 7 microns in diameter is just about the size of the nucleus in the liver, whether it's fatty or not. Okay. The effective acoustic concentration comes out a little different for normal liver and fatty liver. And if we go back to that equation, which I stuck up here, for number density, it says for normal liver, there are about 430 nuclei per millimeter cubed, and for fatty liver, a um, bit less. In other words, we're, 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 we're getting to the point also with our procedures where we can start coming up with estimates of a size and from that we can get something like this concentration which will then yield back something regarding how many of those scatters are there per unit volume. In other words, more quantitative information derived from the tissue. So. Thank you. They eat acacia leaves. What do you foresee as clinical application? Well, I mean, it could be a, the, the most straightforward thing that I can think of because I just showed you liver. Is you walk during the normal physical exam, everybody would have on the annual exam their ultrasound index. Of their liver. So you can actually start seeing when the when you start getting fatty liver disease building up at the most earliest stages, two, three, four percent of fat, long before any clinical symptoms would show up. Um, in the case of tumors, we're starting to develop uniqueness of different kinds of tumors. So we're now starting, I mean fiber adenomas, which I didn't show, are off the charts. So we can already pretty well tell you that it's a fiber adenoma. We can't tell you if there's any cancer hidden in it yet, which of course it happens. But, if it, if it, but we can tell you right away that that is a fiber adenoma. For different class tumors now, we send four different malignant breast tumors. Um, we get uniqueness in those backscatter coefficients from which we get uniqueness of some of these quantities. So we can start coming up with some ideas for you of what is the ranking of the kind of classification or the, which, which tumor it is. You know, you've got to go to the clinical studies to verify that, but in the animals, the big clinical stuff, we're starting to see that. So that's where, they, where, that's where we'll see it in the clinical group. That, what you've shown, if I understand correctly, what you've shown is in pieces of tissue, what's the challenge of taking this and doing it uh, in the organism? Oh, we, that, that, that first backscatter coefficient that I did was in the live animal. We're doing it in the live animal. The reason we had to get a little piece is because our setup between the 20 and 100 megahertz didn't accommodate a clinical system. In fact, clinical systems are out there for those frequencies. But we did go to the higher frequencies. Just, uh, just like you go to a higher frequency or lower frequency, depending on what you're interested in, to learn something about scattering phenomena. And that's what we're doing. Uh, I really was interested in that last number, the number density. What kind of 
Is we wind up with a three dimensional model where we can actually study scattering from tissue. So, if we were to translate this into measurements, what, what would be a reasonable? Well, for a measurement, I mean, we've measured liver, we can repeat this in the live rabbit. Yeah. Yeah, but because everything had been so computational here, I thought I would show that we are putting 3D stuff together also. But we're doing this in the live animal. Yeah. And this agrees with what we see, you know, in the in the live rabbit. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Bill.